Good afternoon. Uh, we would like to discuss today um, Michael Lynn's The New Class War. We assigned uh, some chapters uh, for it. And then next week, it was our last week, we would like to have uh, you all um, share with the rest of the class your final paper uh, project. Uh, and that can help um, us one, know what you write on, we can give, uh, give you sources, but uh, it creates a, um, a dialogue of the kinds of papers we're writing. Uh, and so it, the upshot is that both, uh, I would like to see both today and next week to be more of a discussion than um, we have had in the past. Michael Lynn is a, uh, a uh, scholar, journalist, he's now at University of Texas, he's been very prolific um, in uh, his writings on uh, variants of what in this book is called uh, the New Class War. Uh, and uh, we've uh, articulated different um, problems in the United States, both historically and especially in the contemporary, as I mentioned last week, um, Professor Unger's um, articulation of this um, vision of a democracy. I thought this immensely sophisticated vision is, is truly brilliant. Um, and so I would like to begin by having one of you, and if you don't answer, I can call on you. Um, what is Michael Lynn's basic argument about the new class war, and do you see any solutions he has for it? <coughs> start? Yeah, I can start. I, I definitely won't be able to summarize all of the That's argument, fine. but um, I think um, <coughs> things in particular that I picked out, especially in the first two chapters, which I found most accessible, um, were the idea of like work, kind of the petty bourgeoisie that we've been talking about, yes. um, the idea of the working class, and a managerial kind of class, yes. um, a divide that's shifted over time of elites versus everybody else. Yeah. And a lot of that having to do, from Lynn's perspective, with education. Yeah. He talks a lot about degrees being really important to yes. how people are able to be in this elite. Yes. Um, I was really interested by the conversation of immigration in this yeah. as well, and how that impacts um, both kind of like ends of the spectrum, although I wouldn't say ends, I think it influences the entire spectrum of wealth in the U.S. Um, and Europe, which is part of the argument here, too. Um, i trying to think what else. Um, like, I think the corporate question comes up. Um, maybe not a question. The corporate idea of like corporations as taking kind of control of the U.S. Um, and politics and mm -hmm. government and how that comes up. Um, even the conversation that, that happened and I think it was the Ketz Nelson reading as well about yes, um, yes. looking at how we went from the potential of having a very like worker centric uh -huh. um, political system and government uh -huh. to the way that the government has worked with corporations and with big business rather than with people. Yes. It was a lot of what I saw. I found the conversation in I think chapter three of, of that was more about different systems of um, like industrial society, liberalism, producerism, socialism, corporatism, and pluralism, a little bit less accessible, but that may just be because I don't have much of a background in that. Um, but a question that I did have that came up in this for me was, it seems like Lind is very, like, maybe not very, but opposed to the idea of a producerist artisanal economy. Mm -hmm. He uh, claims that it's a romantic idea. Mm -hmm. that's, that's something that we've talked about a bit in the past in the history of the US and something that's an attractive idea to me. Right. So I would be interested to hear both of your and anyone else's perspectives on how that doesn't just fit into the past of the US, but how that could be more than just a romantic idea for the future. That's very good, yes. Thank you, going off of what you just said, because um, that really interests me. So, because we talked, for example, I think last week, yes. we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked about, you told us about the Louisiana governor, the yes. very leftist yes. populist. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. As <laughs> left as he could be in exactly. Louisiana. In exactly. The... And so I, especially not coming from the U.S., I always associated the U.S., you know, with the Red Scare, McCarthy, you know, uh, Truman Doctrine. Uh -huh. And then in your class, I hear so much about really big leftist movements being really successful in the U.S. decades ago. And now today, where at least from an outside perception, American politics on both sides, uh, Democrat and Republican, is so influenced by, I think you call it big packs, like big pack money, right. where you know corporations, oil corporations, right. invest so much money. Right. The, pr the There's like a rice spike in um, campaigning. You have to have millions and millions of dollars just to have a chance of running. Yes. Where does that development come from? How has that changed from this really big leftist movement? Of course, this emergence of the Soviet Union, Red Scare, had its influence. But today, with the big pack, especially on both sides, not only Republicans, but also Democrats, how does that, I mean, on your opinion, I would be interested to hear your opinion on how that influences American democracy today. That influence of the packs, like big packs and um, companies influencing campaigns by donating money. Yeah, I think, so I can bring it back to Lynn. I would say that he sees an influence, uh, but the for him, the greater problem is more structural uh, in terms of uh, relying on very cheap labor overseas, the internationalization of uh, corporations, which is, uh, and the exploitation of uh, overseas uh, labor and uh, companies. Uh, and uh, there's also a geographic aspect to his argument. Um, in which uh, the, um, the the poor are in rural tend to be in rural areas, and in fact, he does an analogy with England, in which the, the those advocating uh, uh, England from leaving uh, the Union, uh, the European Union, were in lived in certain parts of the country, had lower um, socioeconomic. Uh, lives, and uh, he, I mean, he highlights a, what's now become a familiar trend, and the heart, the heartlands are the, the site and the source of uh, the conservative base of the Republican Party, um, and uh, so he is the, the um, and it's a, a change of the law, which was what, 20 years ago? Uh, that dates back to the 19th century, the, the, the first, in, in 1870 or 1880, it was a, uh, it was a, a lawsuit against uh, the a railroad company in California uh, and whether or not this railroad company could be defined as a person. Um, were, were companies defined as persons legally? And uh, the Supreme Court determined that they were. Uh, and that became, um, uh, Roberto, you could probably name, provide more detail on the Santa Clara County versus um, uh, the Santa Fe Railroad. Um, and the railroad was able to define itself as an individual, as a person and won this uh, law, this um, suit where in which the money was not that good. But it then led to um, a, uh, the, the ability to define a corporation as having the same rights. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, other Others wanting to build on or revise what's been said. So here he says that, that he describes the. This is at the, at the the end of chapter two. The geographic polarization that is evident in Western democracies. Then, so he's not just focusing on the United States, but the United States is his main source. 
reflects the social divide among classes who live in different areas, college educated over classes and the disproportionately immigrant working poor in the high density hubs and the mostly native, mostly white working classes in the low density heartlands. There are differences over environmental policy, trade, immigration, and other issues reflect conflicting interests, values, lifestyles, and aspirations. Uh, and so he characterizes this as a class war. Um, and can this new class war uh, give way to a new class peace? Uh, and uh, so that's his, that's his, uh, what he seeks to articulate. How do you overcome this class war uh, and to achieve uh, a, a greater semblance of democracy in the form of a class peace? Does anyone want to um, weigh in? So he sees um, part of his solution is to draw on the example of uh, the post-World War II um, uh, political or economic solution. And one of the things he borrows from John Kenneth Galbraith um, was this notion of a countervailing power. So corporations have power, corporate heads have power, the countervailing power for Galbraith, which he saw as productive and beneficial to capitalism and democracy, the countervailing power is chiefly in terms of union. The ability to unionize and through unionization is the, there is an, an, a countervailing voice and thus power that had teeth in um, that Cold War period. Um, and it lasted from the 19, uh, 1940s until roughly uh, the 70s or 80s. Uh, and then it starts to collapse. And uh, Lynn wants to recover this countervailing power to prevent uh, corporations from uh, having almost unrestricted power uh, given the, the, um, the changes in the political climate and the laws. And so essentially he's borrowing from this older model. And so my question to you all is, do you think that is an effective solution? If so, why? If not, why? So I suppose, John, there are two questions in that question. One is, was it an effective solution then? when it was proposed. The other is, would it be an effective solution now? Yes, yes, uh -huh. yes. So it, um, Galbraith sees it as having been an effective solution. Uh -huh. uh, not everyone does. Um, it was, first of all, a, a period before, uh, a good part of it was a period before civil rights. Um, and uh, in this, it, was, it was effective uh, in certain parts of the country. It was less effective in the South. It was less effective in uh, rural communities. Uh, it was effective for large corporations 
with a huge number of employees, uh, and the employees through their unionization could offset uh, some of the um, uh, some of the uh, efforts uh, to exploit um, workers and resources, uh, and uh, so there is there's actually a huge debate on whether or not um, these, this countervailing power was uh, effective. Yes. I mean, we're seeing at the moment in Germany and in France that the unions bring the people on the on on the street. Uh -huh. uh, um, it's not the companies, it's not the politicians, it's the unions which yes. gather yes. the workers yes. and claim, you know, better 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 money for the workers. So yes. it's, it seems that it's it's working nowadays. Yes. 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 It. it well, actually, that's a good question. Is it working in France right now? <laughs> but obviously, it seems kind of a power. Yes, it's very much a power. It's definitely a power, um, uh, which is what the um, I mean, labor unions had considerable clout in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and they had seats at the executive table when corporations were making decisions about new products, about expansion, contraction, et cetera. Um, and so from a lot of, for, for a large number of people, the, that, that countervailing power was an effective strategy to prevent exploitation and uh, with the exception of, uh, and it's a huge exception, um, uh, with the exception of race, um, until the civil rights movement and the changes of the laws, uh, it worked effectively for white workers. A significant detail <coughs> is that in France, the most powerful unions are unions of the public monopolies, like the railroads. Yes. Uh, and this is the same situation we have in the United States, in which unionization survives primarily in the public sector or in the third sector, but not in private corporations. That's right, that's right. Um, so the, yeah, the AT&T used to have a very strong union, and AT&T um, listened to the union and brought the union to the table. This was when AT&T was a regulated monopoly. So it was much easier for them to mm -hmm. achieve that. Um, but yeah, that's a very. Um, yes. It seems that it's a regulating force which is much faster than the politics. You know, if you yes. if you think of inflation, which is happening at yes. the moment, yes. with the union again, which yes. Is, yes. can react. Yes. On the on the on the situation. Yes. Yes. Um, unions can have um, can can force a uh, a change or and and pre prevent this long. I mean, people in power, if they're if I mean, corporate corporate heads, it's easy for them to say we will we'll look at it, we'll analyze it, and five years later, nothing has happened. Whereas unions um, uh, prevent that, can prevent that from happening, can, can prevent the, the um, essentially the failure through delay of happening. But yes. The UAW was the United Auto Works. Pardon me. The United Auto Works yes. was an extremely large and extremely uh, effective. If long period where General Motors, um, with, with the um, influence of the UAW, General Motors was seen as one of the major uh, companies in the country. Um, exactly, and, and when it went under, the common comment was that it was bankrupted from um, the benefits that it had to pay it, it's workers. Um, and when professors were asking for the same kind of health insurance um, and benefits that uh, the auto workers had, a lot of universities said, 
we're not going to bankrupt ourselves the way UAW. I mean, I was on a board at that time where that, that was our argument. Right. But for UAW and for a lot of other corporations, the, the um, General Motors and the UAW were, was um, that countervailing power arguably worked at a time in which 99% of Americans bought United, um, American made cars. And once um, the uh, trade restrictions or the the, um, the universal trade, the trading from other countries, the, 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 the free trade across the globe is what destroyed, uh, and you're absolutely right, once the competition from foreign made cars becomes much more a uh, part of American life and the UAW refuses to reduce or compromise in terms of their, uh, their benefits, that's when General Motors um, goes bankrupt. Uh, and, and Lynn talks about the influence of uh, international trade, free trade throughout the world. What does he say about it? Is he, a, is he, is he an advocate for, you're shaking your head now, why? He's an economic nationalist. He wants, he wants more state intervention. That's right. He's anti-utopian, both left and right. That's right. But his description of what he considers, I guess, the the median, yes, is by by U.S. history standards, is not really the middle ground. Yes, yes, that's very good. That's very good. I thought his his use of the term arbitrage for arbitrage for taxes, arbitrage for labor, so that. And, and we've provided more and more flexibility to move capital around, to move labor around, right. has really reduced the bargaining power of American labor. Yes, yes, very much so. On the other hand, as I'm sitting here thinking, it's still a powerful transportation union. That's not ex exactly public of, of truck drivers and commercial freight and the dock workers. And, um, that still have power in the in the bargaining process. Yes, yes, yeah, that's true. It's residual it's, power. It's the modern yeah, economy. It, it's uh. the knowledge economy where labor has no 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 voice. No it's voice. not no just voice. that it has no voice in the knowledge economy. It has no voice because of the knowledge that's economy right. and the rest <laughs> of the economy. <laughs> I mean, one of the biggest shifts in, <laughs> in corporate America in the past 50 years is the truly radical decline of labor unions. But they're not, they're not completely unempowered. They still have, even the, the auto workers, you, you can't, export all of the manufacturing across the border into Mexico. Right. Uh, and there are, in fact, laws to prohibit that about countries of origin for manufacturing. That's really a big play now in electric cars. Yes, yes, um, yes. He's also, I mean, I only read the first four chapters of your science. I don't know the rest of the book. Right. But this has been completely a producer-oriented argument. It is yes. not a consumer-oriented argument. That's right. So many of the practices that he decries because of the influence in the American worker is not rationally offset by the other impact of the American worker, which is more expensive goods. Yes, yes. That's very good. That's very good. I always think of the dollar t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Manufactured in, in earlier times in China. Yes. And it's hard to refuse a dollar t-shirt. <laughs> So do you agree with Lynn's argument? No. Why? Because it's, again, from these chapters, first off, he, he bends situations or exaggerates situations to back his polemic. Yeah. 
And I think if I went through this line by line, there's a lot of this you could just tear apart as being more polemical than data driven. Yes. And two is it's, it's, it's utopian in its own way. I mean, he wants more voices coming into the management of capital. Right. And the more voices you bring in, presumably the less efficient capital is going to be. He sees the more vo the greater voices as uh, greater democracy. Right. And and back to the other argument, we are all workers and we are all consumers, That's and right. both sides of that transaction have to be comprehended to make a sound policy. Yes. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah. It's very interesting because we have that argument often in in in, Germ in a German context. <clears throat> So I'm from Berlin, yeah. and in Berlin we have a very famous airport that didn't got completed for like 20 years, even though we are the capital of the country, supposedly, you know, Germany, so many engineers, why isn't an airport built faster? And even today, now it's finished, it still has constructed like mistakes. And you often hear, especially from like populist parties, I look to China, where, you know, a center like, you know, like very few, people in power can control the economy, therefore everything is so efficient, it's built quickly. So they build airports, you know, airports are being built within one year, two years, huge airports, huge projects, but then it's often not um, mentioned how many people suffer under those economic decisions um, in that process. While in Germany, it takes so long because for one, the bureaucracy is massive, but also because it has to go through a lot of political decision processes before the building process can start, because the unions are being involved, uh, it's being voted in elections. Um, and so, and then you even see in a dictatorship like, um, you know, um, in a dictatorship like uh, China currently, the economic um, advances are also lowering. So the uh, annual GDP is uh, decreasing and they're encountering issues as well. So maybe you have some thoughts on that, On you know, economics as like a foundation for democracy, for liberal democracies, or how, you know, if an uh, economic system is successful, how can that support a functioning democracy? It is a very good question. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> well, the I think that... between economics and... Well, I answer it maybe in a way that draws attention to, to, to Lynn's argument and its relation to the argument of our course. So one, a, a strange thing in Lynn's argument is that there's no conception presented of the background changes in the structure of the economy, particularly in the, in, in the structure of production, so that this new class war, as it were, emerges from nothing or emerges as the result of an ideological maneuver, the successful attack of neoliberalism on the then dominant ideas. So it's a mystery uh, why this happened. So what is not mentioned in Lind and has been crucial in our arguments throughout the semester is a change in the organization of the economy and the direction of production. The social background of the uh, center-left parties throughout the world, uh, and especially in the rich North Atlantic countries, was Fordist mass production. The production of standardized goods and the, the large-scale production of standardized goods and services by semi-skilled labor using rigid machines and production processes in very hierarchical and specialized relations of production. Uh, a, large a large stable labor force was assembled in large productive units like factories under the aegis of large corporate entities. Yes. Huh? That was the background of the center-left parties. That was their social basis. Yes. These workers, the stable labor force, headquartered in the capital-intensive sectors of the economy. So 
The fundamental reason for, the, for this crisis resulting in what Lynn describes as the new class war right. is what he doesn't mention, which is the disappearance of that world. That's right. So that vanguard, that vanguard of production has been now replaced by another vanguard. It's the insular knowledge economy that we describe right. that is characteristically fabulous that is, there's no physical structure and there's no stable labor force. And this new vanguard, rather than deepening and spreading throughout the economy, does the opposite. It retreats uh, into an inner circle. It keeps for itself the creative and lucrative core of the business. And every part of the production process that can be routinized or commoditized, it subcontracts yes, yes. to workers and firms in other parts of the world right. where there's a lower wage and a lower tax take. Right. And that's then the reality that's described as labor and tax arbitrage. Yeah. Uh, so that's the fundamental reality which has changed the situation to the detriment of labor yes. and subverted the, the the practical economic basis of the center-left parties. Right. Now, then it's necessary to have an unsentimental conception of what this social democratic settlement was, because it had three main components, which Lynn doesn't describe. So the first component was a division between insiders and outsiders. This division is not a creation of what Lynn calls the new class war. This division was already a characteristic of historical social democracy. It was a division between insiders and outsiders. First in the labor market, in all of these countries, there was a, 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 a group of relatively tenured and relatively privileged workers. Right. These workers who worked in the capital intensive industries and there was always a set of outsiders, the workers who worked in the undercapitalized parts of the economy uh, and often in unstable employment. Yeah. And there was also a division between corporate insiders and corporate outsiders. So uh, the practices of historical social democracy favored the corporate incumbents against the corporate challengers or disruptors. The second set of themes of historical social democracy was the orchestration by the state, by the central government, of deals called incomes policies or social contracts between big business and organized labor. And the idea was to have a successful macroeconomic policy, there had to be consent there had to be agreement about the distribution of the benefits and costs of each pathway of macroeconomic growth, because that's the only way in which there could be progress uh, and peace, industrial peace, economic peace, in the economy and in politics. And the third part of historical social democracy was the preservation of a high level of social entitlements, investment in people and in their capabilities, paradoxically financed by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption, as through the comprehensive flat rate value added tax or its functional equivalents. So the basic history of this compromise, of this social and ideological settlement was that social democracy increasingly gave up those first two characteristics, the division between insiders and outsiders, and the social contracts, the social deals, and retreated to the last line of defense. The last line of defense is the preservation of the high level of social entitlements financed by the regressive taxation of consumption. Now, why did it do this? Why did it retreat? This is all part of the story that Lynn doesn't tell. Uh, so, it, first there was an ideological argument. Uh, 
So the, the, the divisions between insiders and outsiders and the social compacts were attacked on two bases. The first is that they imposed costly rigidities on the economy, mm -hmm. resulting in the loss of output and in limitations on the rise of productivity, that they were inefficient. The second basis for the attack is that they were unfair. They were unfair because they were premised on this division between the insiders and the outsiders. So the labor, the so-called labor aristocracy was favored, everyone else was harmed. Huh? But this ideological attack would not, would not have been enough, it would have been powerless if it had not been sustained by an objective transformation in the structure of the economy, which was then the decline, the dis disintegration of Fordist mass production, and the rise of this new vanguard with, it, with its insular character, mm -hmm. the insular knowledge economy that we have today. So that's the essential background. So the first criticism of Lin that I would make is that he says nothing about that. But without that, we can't understand what happened. Now, the second criticism is that he then proposes as a solution to the resulting problems. Uh, the 20th century solution to the 21st century problem. In other words, the 20th century solution is countervailing power. Exactly the, right. the workers were already organized They're in, in the mass production, yeah. so build on their organization. Right, right. But now if their organization has been shattered by the disappearance of its objective economic base, there's no way to restore the 20th century solution on the basis of the 21st century reality. So that's the second major criticism. So that, of course, then leads to the question, well, what would work to master this new reality? And that has been one of the main objects of our discussions during the semester. So, and just to summarize then what that idea would be, first, that there would have to be a productivist project, and that we, we would have to take the initiatives that could lead us from the knowledge economy for the few that we have today to the knowledge economy for the many that we lack. There would have to be a 21st century equivalent to the 19th century agricultural extension, a lift-up operation. And the beneficiaries, the addressees of this uplift would be, on the one hand, the relatively backward, small and medium-sized enterprises of the present economy, and the individualized economic agents who have lost connections, stable connections with business enterprises. Right. Huh? And they would have to be transformed into technologically equipped artisans. Right. Yes, you had a question. So I wanted to ask, uh, when President Biden came into office, he announced this big back better plan, Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I want to bring all those uh, companies, I want to, production has to be Amer like in America again, right? We want to make more jobs on a big scale, millions of jobs. We're bringing back all the different productions back into the country and we are building everything here. Would this be a productivist project? Not necessarily. Not? It depends, as everything does in politics, on what happens next. So... In other words, it, there's an ambiguity in this. Is it, is, it, is it, as it were, the first step in a uh, attempt to deepen and disseminate the knowledge economy, uh, to do this uplift of both the backward firms and the individual economic agents? Or is it simply, this is the other side of the ambivalence, a subsidy to capital? So. The answer to that question, as I say, depends on what happens next, because the next step will then clarify the meaning of the earlier step. So the, the first great element of the productivist project is this uplift. The second is an attempt to master in law the new reality of unstable employment, the secondary part of the labor market, which in every country in the world, including the United States, is now the major part of the labor market. 
And we can't master that reality by pretending they can be governed by this, by this system of unionization, by the countervailing power of the 20th century. We need a new way to uh, intervene in the employment relationship and distinguish legitimate economic flexibility from dangerous and illegitimate cheapening of the wage and radical economic insecurity. So a new code, a new, a new law, a new set of rules and principles to master the reality of these unstable relations of production. We can't decree their illegality. We can't suppress them by law, but we can attempt to govern them in, by, by a new set of legal ideas. So that's, so that's the first thing that would be missing. That in then turn leads to the question of democracy. In what form of political life could we uh, address these problems uh, uh, and provide a powerful response to the neoliberal agenda? Uh, uh, and the argument has been throughout the semester we would need a higher energy democracy, increasing the temperature of politics, the level of organized popular <coughs> engagement in political life, hastening the pace of politics, resolving impasse quickly, and combining a facility for decisive central action with radical devolution, so we organize an experimentalism in the society. Uh, and those two sets of initiatives in the economy, in production and in politics, have to be accompanied then by a set of ideas. Uh, the focus of ideological conflict changes. It's no longer a contest between the market and the state. How much market, how much state, what kind of synthesis between market and state. It's a contest about the alternative institutional forms of economic, political, and social pluralism. The way in which the market order, mm -hmm. the, the democratic politics, and independent civil society can and should be organized. Mm -hmm. That's a different kind of conflict from the conflict that the world has seen so far. Mm -hmm. And then we have a problem in the academy because, uh, and in the whole world, we have a kind of division between a shrunken formulaic Marxism, which has ab abdicated the transformative aspirations of Marxism but kept the historical fatalism, and then American-style policy discourse in social science, which relentlessly suppresses the structural vision, right. Uh, right. and is the embodiment in social science of what in philosophy we call right-wing Hegelianism, the real is rational. Uh, and so there has to be disruption and rebellion in the academy, in all of the disciplines, so that we can uh, achieve, once again, the imagination of the possible, which is the basis for insight into the actual. So, of course, none of this is in Lynn, no, no. but it is in the arguments of our course. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Question? Now, yes. now one, sure. one more thing I want to say before I call you in. Uh, it's, it's, so, in addition to having this agenda, political, economic, political, and cultural of the imagination, in the United States we have to face the two great detours which now prevent the American progressives from focusing on this agenda. Mm -hmm. One is this uh, inadequate way of dealing with the relation between class and race mm -hmm. in which they have separated out race from class mm -hmm. and focused exclusively on race and on physical identities uh, and rather than connecting the two. Mm -hmm. And the other detour has been uh, allowing themselves to engage in this war of moral agendas, mm -hmm. of religious sensibilities in which the class that Lynn describes as the overclass, the managerial 
technical class, uh, accepts a, uh, the so-called modernist or secular moral agenda, and wages war against the religious and moral sensibilities of the people, of the working class. Uh, and then we have two primitive moral agendas uh, in, in contest with each other, and the attempt, at least in the previous historical period of the overclass, to capture the federal judiciary and impose its moral agenda on the country by law and by interpretation of the Constitution. And these two detours have had a calamitous effect on the course of American democracy. So that completes the picture yeah. that yeah. Lynn fails to draw. A truly calamitous effect um, in terms of manipulating the law. I mean, I'm, in the 19th century, the Dred Scott decision, <laughs> uh, which for most scholars, the Dred Scott decision was a decision issued in 1857 um, that uh, that uh, it was there are three prongs and it was a, it was over the divide or the debate between the new Republican Party, which was centered on an anti-slavery party, and the pro-slavery Democrats, and uh, uh, the decision, the majority opinion. Uh, Emphasizing it was a fairly, it was I think a, um, a decisive vote of the court. They um, overturned all of the anti-slavery visions of uh, the Republican Party. So the first question they addressed, Roger Taney, the, Supreme, the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, is um, what is the status of uh, an African American? They said that the uh, the natural status of African Americans are all slaves, uh, which essentially opened the way then for enslaving free blacks in the South. Um, and the second was, uh, is, uh, can African Americans be citizens? No, they can never be citizens. Uh, and uh, it, he, uh, Tawney also, or the Supreme Court in its decision, uh, says that it's unconstitutional to prohibit the spread of slavery anywhere, which opens the way for these former free states to becoming slave states. But all this contest in the 19th century over slavery should have been in the United States a way into the struggle over class. That's exactly right. And that's right. not what happened. No. The opposite happened. That no. is, the focus on race was used as a diversion from the confrontation with class. Yeah, although in the 1850s, the, the class divide in the North was not that great. I mean, most Northerners were still artists. Because that was still in this petty bourgeois, exactly. it wasn't a, economy. Yes. The Civil War is what absolutely yeah. destroys the artisanal class and creates these huge corporations. In fact, the number of corporations And then there's the, there's the mass migration. And the mass migration, In yes. the late 19th century, which then produces the labor force yes. for Fordist industrial yes. production. Yes. Yeah, yeah, beginning. Now, you yeah. back there had to, you wanted to say something. Back to what you were saying earlier, what is your feeling, though, about entrepreneurialism? Where does entrepreneurialism fit in with a grander picture? One reason I ask is, I, I know your argument is not Lynn's argument, but in Lynn's argument well, here, well, he's uh, uh, top 10 multinational companies by foreign assets. And in his list, one of them is General Electric, which subsequent to this completely fell apart. Right. Uh -huh. right. Um, one of them is Anheuser-Busch InBev, whose stock, I just checked on Bloomberg, is trading yeah. at half of where it was when he, was when he wrote this article. And with the exception of the two in Japan, all the others are oil companies, which, of course, their business is to own assets and yeah. license, right? So, but then he mentions at the end, Toyota, Daimler, and Ford tend to retain their national identity at the leadership level, which doesn't account for Tesla, which came subsequent to this, yes. which has knocked everybody for a loop. Yes. So the entrepreneur comes along and does the destructive work for us. And we talk about a technocracy when I was in, when I graduated from college, 1981, I didn't have a computer. I mean, I was still typing papers on the two fingers of the ribbon. Uh -huh. 
you know, the world changes fast because of the entrepreneur. And how do you think that, that the entrepreneur fits in with what you were Well, it's interesting. So let's relate this to the theme that John just mentioned of the artisanal economy in the early 19th century. So when, when you have the situation that Tocqueville observed in the United States, and almost every white man works for himself rather than working for another white man, it's easy to, to sustain an entrepreneurial ideal because in principle everyone can be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Everyone is his own master. Right. Now then in this reality that Lynn describes of, of technocracy, of planning, of big organizations, the entrepreneurial initiative is suppressed, right? Yeah. And, that's, and so that's the, the meaning of this vocabulary of, of planned management. Mm. It's like uh, a kind of mini Soviet Union in each of right. these corporations. Right. Huh? Uh, and so th then there's the question that comes to us from the 19th century. How could we reconcile this radical deconcentration of economic initiative and opportunity with the unforgiving imperative of economies of scale? That's the unsolved problem. And to do that, we ultimately need innovation in the regime of property. Mm -hmm. We need a radical decentralization. Now, that's where the thought experiment I mentioned comes in just to clarify conceptually what's at stake. Uh, it's this ambiguity in the market, in the idea of the market, right? You bring, if you take the idea of a market to the ultimate level of generality and abstraction, it still has at least two dimensions. One dimension is the absolute level of economic decentralization. Mm -hmm the number of economic agents who can bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. Mm -hmm. The more decentralized it is, the more of a market it becomes. That's one dimension. The other dimension has to do with the absoluteness of the control that each of those agents has over the resources at their command. And absoluteness in scope, absolute control over those resources, and absoluteness in time, perpetual control, which they can continue beyond their own lives through the hereditary transmission of property. The, the, the primitive idea of, of the law in the 19th century and of the liberal ideology was these two dimensions go together, naturally and necessarily absolute decentralization and absolute and perpetual control. But they don't go together because there's no, not only are they not necessarily related, but they very clearly contradict each other because one way to increase the amount of absolute decentralization is to limit the absoluteness of the control, to create claims on productive resources that are temporary, conditional or fragmentary. Then you can design an institutional order in which more people can have access to more markets in more ways. Mm -hmm. And you can restore the basis for what you're calling the entrepreneurial spirit. Right. So what then, if, if we imagine radically uh, what a thought experiment that teases out the practical implications of this idea, it's the thought experiment that I mentioned. Imagine the productive resources of society vested in independent trusts. Uh, so, and these trusts, competitively managed, professionally managed, conduct a rotating capital auction. In other words, they auction off temporarily the productive resources of society to whoever can give them the trusts the highest rate of return for the temporary use of those resources. Uh, so, and if you ask the question, who owns them? The answer is no one, because we're not transferring the property, the unified property, from the private owner to the state, or to the workers for that matter, if it's worker ownership, where no one owns them, but they, can, they conduct this rotating capital auction. 
That's the system that I described as capitalism without capitalists. And that's then, so we need to somehow to go in that direction, uh, of this direction of uh, allowing the largest number of agents in the broadest number of ways to have the greatest possible access to productive resources and opportunities. Conditionally, in a fragmentary and temporary way, rather than in the form of perpetual and absolute control. That's the way in which we would popularize the entrepreneurial ideal. And there's a huge distance, because now if you take the contemporary American economy, where do you find the entrepreneurial spirit? You don't find it in the business enterprises where they're making things, for the most part. You find it in finance. So it's the vulture funds, the, the private equity funds, the venture capital funds, the financiers who now give the big donations to the universities mm -hmm. and have the universities rename the faculties on their name. <laughs> That's where you find the entrepreneurial spirit yeah. uh, in this perverse, distorted form. That, that we should rebel against in the name of both democracy and production. John. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautifully stated. Uh, you're absolutely right. So, so how, what would be the first step? Well, we discussed that. But I think the first step in everything is always modest. Yeah, you asked exactly. me once about the first steps when we had this, yeah. we had the programmatic yes. discussion last week. So I would say, it, of, uh, uh, in all the elements of a productivist project, uh -huh. the first step is this modest uplift that begins in doing now for production what the Americans did in the early 19th century for agriculture, right, right. beginning to lift it up, bringing advanced practice technology to the producer, influencing the evolution of technology so that the use of technology to enhance labor comes to prevail over the use of technology to replace labor. Right. Uh, uh, so, in, in the productivist project, the first step is the qualification, the economic empowerment of the relatively backward producer, whether it's a small firm right. in the periphery of the economy or whether it's an individual economic agent who is acting on his own He's repairing machines. I gave the example of a nurse practitioner, right. another example. And the aim is to transform that person into a technologically equipped artisan. That's the beginning. Yeah. Huh? So you, you, you try and bring the rear guard closer to the vanguard. You try and diminish the distance, right? right? right. I would say that in politics, the beginning is re-energizing uh, re-energizing federalism so that, so that the federal system is transformed into what it was falsely described as being, which is these laboratories of experimentation. The society goes down a certain track, it hedges its bets by allowing parts of itself to deviate from the predominant solutions and generate counter models of the national future. And then in the field of culture, uh, the disruption of the established disciplines, beginning with the two disciplines that are closest to power, which are economics and law. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And you, 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 you reorient them so that they're instruments of the institutional imagination rather than vehicles of the retrospective rationalization of the established order. So in one respect, based on what you've said, is that, that a, a very early, if not the first step, 
would need to be revising the educational system and structure to facilitate this change that they, these... I don't think that, I wouldn't describe that as the first step. No, no, I wouldn't because I think if, if we have a, so you, you know I'm an advocate of an experimentalist yes, form of education, right. a radicalization yes, of the yes. Deweyan program, yes. one might say in the American idiom. Yes. But if, if, the arrange, if the practices and arrangements of the politics and society say the opposite to what the school is saying, what the school says in the end won't matter. So there has to be a change in the, in the political and economic direction so that the lessons of life do not contradict the lessons of the school. The lessons of the school are powerful to the extent that they seem to resonate with what's happening in society and culture. Not if they're a, a voice, a discordant voice, which finds no echo in the practical experience of everyday life. Yes, I see what I, uh, I, I, I understand what you're saying. So in other words, the, the um, I'm giving too much credit or power to the possibility of change within the You're imagining that the lightning strikes the individual <laughs> imagination. The sure. prophet arises in a world which is smothered under the yeah. prose of reality. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and but defies everything. No, I, I agree with you about the importance of the uh, the Dewey approach to learning. But I I, uh, I thank you for that um, clarification. Yes, aren't the financiers like auctioneers auctioning off capital? Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean the, yeah. the 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 basis of contemporary financial markets is precisely the fragmentation of the property right. right. That's why we call them financial derivatives. Technically, legally, they are derivatives of the unified property right. That's, that's the basis. And so they're using these derivatives uh, for their activity. Huh? And so, and calls and puts, the, main, the classic financial derivatives, mm -hmm. had a made an undoubted contribution to, uh, uh, to production in the commodity markets yeah. where they began, right? Yeah. They, they advanced liquidity, they promoted liquidity. When they were introduced into the equity markets, also originally supposed, supposedly as a safeguard against gambling, as a way to limit risk, they were later converted into devices of gambling, which is a what they, gambling. which is what they have become yes, in yes. in in the in the in the equity markets. So this entrepreneurial spirit is now associated with financial speculation in these economies, the financialization of the economy. And I have to say, this is not a discourse against the speculative element in finance. The speculative element in finance is useful when it develops information and organizes the allocation of risk. Mm -hmm. It's an argument against the disassociation of speculative finance from production. That's the problem. It's not the speculative element in finance per se, it's its disconnection from the agenda of production. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I have a question in regards of investing in education, not necessarily for um, fueling the knowledge economy, but to navigate or fight against misinformation. So I'm thinking about, someone mentioned the Build Back Better program, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking about investment in infrastructure in the United States. We mm -hmm. have pockets in our society, like in the mainland, where people don't have access to the internet. And with the entrepreneurial spirit, you do need access to certain capacities that connect you to a new labor force, which is much more competitive in a transnational economy, yet misinformation and power structures within our, let's say our federal governments, are making it a bipartisan issue instead of what it should be, which is an investment in our own economy. So I'm wondering how does that work out? Just investing in education 
to navigate misinformation to invest within well, our Well, of course, economy. but it's always better when investment in infrastructure is related to the specifics of the productivist project. So uh, in, in Roosevelt's time and also in Eisenhower's time, there was a road building project yeah. in the United States, but was intimately related to the, to the development of the automotive industry, to the, to the cars. Huh? Now they talk about infrastructure, but it's, it, it's not particularly related to, to any productivist project. Just it's good to prevent the, the bridges from falling down, for example. It's like solar or you power, gave the, for example? Excuse me? Like solar power alternative modes of, um, let's say, like not rely on oil, but solar power. Like sure, making of course, of course. Access to clean water, yeah. trains, instead of just having of to course, get a Of course, yeah. of course, of course. But, but I think the problem is now that the way that the, one of the reasons why all of these initiatives appear to be mere subsidies to capital, uh, payouts, uh, handouts to factions of capital, is that there, is that there isn't this coherent uh, placement of them in a larger productivist project, right? Uh, so they appear as they appear to be mere subsidies. So then would you not consider that a lack of coherence as interference of power structures who do not want it to be? Because I think of that in a form of misinformation where people are sitting down no, having arguments a, about it where it's like that's not the right thing, climate change is bogus, all that stuff. Mm. So the lack of a coherent narrative to push forward a program that would help no, but there's no plan. That's the problem. So, so if you ask, what is the strategy of economic growth in the United States, I think, or of the United States? I think the correct answer is the United States for a long time has had no strategy of economic growth except for one. The real strategy of economic growth has been cheap money, cheap money, uh, and it has been implemented not by the Federal Reserve. Uh, not by the national government, but by the central bank, the Federal Reserve. Huh? And that's then the, that's then the basis for uh, mass, uh, reconciling mass consumption with increasing inequality in the United States. So you, the, the way to reconcile it is to make money cheap and therefore credit cheap, and credit can be popularized because of the overvaluation of the housing stock as collateral. And at the same time, you create asset bubbles that enrich these financiers who then give money to the universities where they're working the economists who then celebrate this achievement. This is, this is the system that's established in the United States. There's no, there's no progressive approach to the supply side of the economy. Uh, the, the, the progressives in the United States regarded as their aim to humanize the market order, which they despair of reimagining and remaking. So they appear on the scene of contemporary history as the humanizers of the inevitable. And their program is to put a human face on the project of their conservative adversaries. That's what we have. And so that's all part of the background to this new class warfare that Lynn describes about which he says nothing. Right. He says nothing about this background. But, but the, these are all the fundamental transformations. And uh, then to say, no, there's a silver bullet. The silver bullet is to restore in the second decade of the 21st century the institutional device used in the middle of the 20th century, unionization, right. countervailing Counter power. Yes. But the unions don't even exist. Yeah. They just exist in the, in, in, in the universities, in the, in the, in, in the government, right. uh, and they don't exist for a reason because the objective reality has destroyed this and transformed the structure of the economy. So I think that all of this argument that we're having today illustrates 
uh, a theme which I've been advocating throughout the semester, which is that our interpretation of the country and its historical experience is powerfully shaped by whether or not we believe that there's an alternative. So the, the programmatic direction then influences the, the imagination of a programmatic alternative, influences powerfully your interpretation of the historical experience. Mm. And I think that this is related to, a, to a, a, a discussion we began to have last week, I, which I, I, should, I should recall now. Remember I said, in, in the 19th century, people thought that the, si the classical system of liberal rights was part of the conception of the definition of freedom. So they said, you want to be free, you want to be rich, then establish this system, unified property, free contract, and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's what they thought then. We no longer believe that. We no longer think this is part of the definition of freedom. We believe something else. And what we believe is the negative thesis that although that is not part of the scheme of ordered liberty, of freedom, there's no way to replace it without endangering freedom. So it's not part of the idea of freedom, but any of the alternatives to it would jeopardize freedom because then the state would be too powerful or there's some corporate body would take over or something. That's what we believe. And then the crucial question becomes, well, what then are the alternatives? So your whole interpretation of the historical circumstance changes depending on whether or not you believe there are alternatives and what the alternatives are. That's why in this discussion about the United States, we've tried to intertwine the conversation about the past with the conversation about the alternatives. Are you familiar with the work of Bruno Latour, he's a French philosopher? Yes, he's philosopher of science. Of science. This, yeah, about the new ecolo ecological class, yes. and that could be kind of a new concept um, for, for, mm -hmm. uh, for democracy. Well, I think that environmentalism is an example of a, a theme which has been used as a kind of post-structural or post-ideological politics in the North Atlantic countries. Uh, so the idea is the, the history has disappointed us. It's yeah. catastrophes. Yeah. Yeah. Now we will seek refuge in the great garden of nature and drown our sorrows in, in this garden. Huh? That's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is that it's a provocation to retake the ideological and structural conflicts in a new form. Uh, and then it requires the reorganization of society and the reformation of our assumptions in order to progress. So a low carbon recovery, uh, requires the transformation of the style of production mm -hmm. and of the economic arrangements. Mm -hmm. Although, to be fair to Bruno Latour, um, his vision of an ecolo his, of an ecology is, um, it's... Um, no, I was not accusing Bruno Latour of no, this post-ideological business. There's a, there's, in terms of the environment, there's been throughout Western culture, you've had two conceptualizations. One is um, the pastoral, and the, pa the idea of the pastoral is um, is ultimately a, a, an engine or a source for regenerating humans. You go into um, this space and you are regenerated. Um, and the the term that emerges in the late twentieth century is eco criticism, where you see um, ecology and the natural uh, world as equal to humans uh, and so you engage with it in a, a way of benefiting both 
the 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 land or the part in which you're in, um, you're in, you're um, you're steeped in, as well as yourself. Um, yes. So in one sense, uh, the, you know, some of the alternatives to uh, to oil and gas are a kind of eco-critical vision that can be profitable for certain communities. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a just to highlight that distinction. Bruno Latour is, I mean, he's he is his conceptualization of ecology is not the pastoral. Took a um, what turn? Exclusivist turn, or if that was a very industry or field dependent. I, I'm thinking about. No, it began that way. Well, I mean, um, and, and, and but I think what's remarkable is so. So first of all, this is not mysterious, right? It's not mysterious in the following way. It's go, going back to this concept of the path of least resistance, which is the background to many of these programmatic arguments. So whenever there is a complex of innovations in the world technological, conceptual, organizational, institutional, the tendency is to downsize the innovations and to assimilate them in the form that least disturbs the, established, the ruling interest and the established preconceptions. That's what you could call the path of least resistance. And the, the insular form of the knowledge economy that we have today is a characteristic example of the path of least resistance. And it's always going to happen in the world that the, 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 the path of least resistance is by definition the easiest one. And it has the advantage of tangibility. It's what's there. It's what's easiest to implement. But it also has a disadvantage. And because of this disadvantage, the enemies of the path of least resistance always have a chance. The disadvantage of the path of least resistance is that it sort of changes the potential of the transformations. And so then the enemies of the path of least resistance say, look, you're giving up on the potential of the knowledge economy drastically to raise production. So the insular form of the knowledge economy has coincided with economic stagnation and with uh, a, a deacceleration of rise in productivity. And that's then what leads the growth theorists like Solo to make his famous quip that the computer revolution is everywhere except in the productivity statistics. So that then is what gives an opportunity to the, to the, uh, to the enemies. Now, my argument has been that for that opportunity to become real in the world, two things have to happen. In every country in the world, and I don't believe that the United States is an exception to it. So in the elites, there has to be a rupture between the rent-seeking elites and, and a, a, a rebellious faction of the elite. And the rebellious faction has to, in some way, associate a productivist commitment with a nationalist commitment. They have to speak for the country, and they have to have a focus on production. And then to appeal to the mass below. And then in this mass below today, my claim is that now the most distinctive feature of the situation in the whole world is that most people are poor if not absolutely poor, relatively poor. But instead of having a proletarian horizon, they have a petty bourgeois horizon. They aspire to modest prosperity and independence. And by default then, if nothing else is presented to them, they gravitate to the aspiration for traditional, archaic, isolated family business. And the spiritual counterparts 
to this archaic economic form are individualism, materialism, and consumerism. The task of the progressives and the task of this dissident part of the national elites is to offer that petty, that mass of what I'm calling the subjective petty bourgeoisie a different way to achieve their aspirations, right. which is not wedded to the archaic productive form of isolated family business and capable of being more solidaristic and magnanimous in its spiritual horizon. So that's the background to this discussion. Right. And I don't think that the United States is an exception to that. I think it's drawn into this worldwide debate. As I said in our very first class, it seems to me that the rational kernel in the mystical shell of the idea of American exceptionalism is this notion that the United States is exceptional only in the sense that it stands at the extreme of a spectrum in the advanced Western societies. It's the most unequal, the most class-ridden, the less willing to recognize its class character, the most religious, uh, and despite all of this inequality and exclusion, the one in which the ordinary men and women are most inclined to think that everything is possible, has the religion of the new. That's the sense in which it's exceptional. But it's not exceptional because it's an exception to these problems that we've just discussed. It, it faces the same problem. And the American project should be an American version of this universal project. Yes? Um, can you help me separate the two ideas that we've discussed in the class? One is um, this sort of like traditional, archaic, sort of back, backward family business, you know, the idea of a small and medium enterprise that doesn't yes. realize. And that's the first idea. The second idea is sort of the artisanal ideal. And, I, and the reason that they're blurring in my mind is because I imagine a lot, a lot of people who we would consider artisans today may, you know, their businesses may not involve the, the, the latest technology. They may not be at the frontiers of the knowledge economy. You know, small restaurant owners, the teacher. Sure. But, but they are artisans yes. in, in ways. So, so but let's approach this idea then historically again. So let, let's go back to the example of the early 19th century. So... To say that the American economy in the early 19th century was an artisanal economy, an economy of craftsmen, of small proprietors, of small tradesmen, is just an objective remark uh, about their scale. Uh, it doesn't say anything about whether they were more advanced or less advanced. Now look at what happened in agriculture, because agriculture was the, one of the main forms of this small scale. They were primitive when they went out there and simply became squatters on the land, it was organized and it was qualified. So they developed a project to take these small proprietors and farmers and to lift them up so that they would acquire entrepreneurial attributes. Uh, and they did that through a series of devices. There was the federal distribution of the lands, the Homestead Acts, there was the organization of the land-grant colleges that brought agricultural science to the door of the farmer and disseminated then what were the most advanced agricultural practices. And then there were a series of devices to secure family-scale agriculture against its peculiar frailty, which is the susceptibility to the destructive combination of economic volatility, price volatility, with physical volatility, uh, climate <laughs> volatility. And, and through agricultural insurance, crop insurance, food Derivative. stockpiles later on, Derivative. price supports, and yes, and, and then later today, financial hedging as, as, as the replacement for old style agricultural insurance. Right. So then what you're saying is that the small-scale artisanal proprietor takes the direction of this uplift. So that's what I'm saying should be done in spades, in every sector of the economy. And that's one of the initial steps in this productivist project.
fully, in a sense, it's integrated. And Roberto, when he was referring to the land grant schools, for decades and decades, they were free. Uh, those, I mean, it was it, it. The act was passed during the Civil War, and it just it transformed education in the country for several decades because it was free, uh, and one received learning and and specific training for a uh, artisanal form of uh, farming. So, you know, in Europe, there are parts of, there are regions of Europe, like North Central Italy, for example, which are characterized by the presence of networks, networks of small and medium-sized firms that develop regimes, practices of cooperative competition. So they pool resources, like as the farmers in the early 19th century did, uh, but they remain independent proprietors and they compete as at the same time that they cooperate. Huh? And uh, it now turns out that the regions with these, and, and these were also regions rich in traditions of craftsmanship, of an artisanal economy. Now we find out that the post Fordist knowledge economy in Europe tends to flourish in regions which were characterized by the heavy presence of this pre-Fordist economy, which was artisanal, characterized by cooperative competition and so forth. So the, the, the pre-Fordist economy offered many of the functional equivalents to what we would now regard as an important presupposition of the knowledge economy. And then the question, of course, becomes, what should we do in those regions which don't benefit from this pre-Fordist background to post-Fordism? And those in Europe are North Central Italy, I mentioned Southwest Germany, and Catalonia and Spain, which all regions with these characteristics. So, and this is, so because one of the technical characteristics of post Fordist production is that it combines destandardization of goods and services, which is a characteristic of artisanal production, with production at scale, which is the characteristic of mass production, and therefore associates what mass production separated. So instead of having craft production on one side and mass production on the other, you have a new form of production that is both, but that depends on all of these requirements. I'm thinking a lot about vocational schools right now where I think a lot about this, at least to me it seems there's a large divide that often college, universities like Harvard are often seen as like the ideal, like the goal, or oh, you know, one day if you do well in school, you can go to Harvard or an Ivy League in the US. But then on the other side, institutions like vocational schools are often disregarded, and then what by vocational schools, you mean technical schools. Correct, correct. Yeah. So especially, again, I can only take this from a German perspective because that's the perspective of like, the country I grew up in. We have the issue that industries in Germany lack workers and they lack people that want to do craftsmen's work mm. because universities are so idealized that, I mean, our system in Germany is extremely one might even argue very class centered because we have three levels of high school. We have the gymnasium, right. which is okay, you go to university. Yeah. Right. We have, we call it a Realschule, which is okay, you go to a technical school. Right. And then we have Hauptschule, which ends at ninth grade. Right? And it's okay, you, you, get, you take the job that you can get right. yeah. um, and you work your way up if you're lucky. Um, and then what that caused is that university is so idealized that it's like, no, you should study. 
you should, you know, go into theory because it's like safe, you know. But then what that causes is that not a lot of people want to do craft bands work and then we lack yeah. huge areas where we like, where's the workers? You know, we need workers. Why are they not here? Because it maybe, I don't know, was a question of didn't the yes, politics but the nat- this but the, the, the But the nature power. of technical education has changed, right? Yeah. The kind of technical education is required. So yeah. the German model of technical education has been the most influential model in the world. And the German model was the model of training for the, in the conventional repertoire of trades and professions. So you train to be an electrician, a metal worker, and so forth. The way in which you train was then focused on job-specific and machine-specific skills. For example, you learn how to use the five kinds of metal cutting lathes. And it's an interesting experience. I recommend it to anyone. Uh, but, but this was the traditional form of, of German technical training, which has had worldwide influence. Now we need a different kind of technical education, which focuses on the higher order, flexible, conceptual, and practical capabilities required for the use of numerically controlled machine tools. It's completely different because uh, a, a, a 3D printer, for example, so-called additive manufacturing, is a machine that you have to reprogram constantly. So you reprogram the machine to materialize some particular project of production. And then you can go back and forth between the conception and the materialization. Uh, and so then you have a new kind of technical education which is on the same continuum as the new kind of general education which you would want. And no reason then to accept the old European contrast between general education for the elites and the old style of technical education for the masses. And if I may, sorry. Um, It's also a common point that, and I'm assuming in the US it's very similar, you often hear um, quite a lot of people saying, oh, I feel left out of politics because I don't feel represented. Uh, you know, there's only professors and lawyers in politics, like in the government, in the parliament. It's often a, like a certain speech, like you hear often like, oh, we need more, you know, there's often that call for more workers, more uh, train conductors, more, um, um, more workers coming into politics. So how do you bring more workers into politics in a democracy? Is it, do you change the way how parties set up the lists? Do you, do you set up quotas? What would be some approaches? Essentially, yeah, diversifying the parliaments in that way. At the, in a lot of states, at the, at the state level of politics, there are, you know, a lot of states' politicians uh, also have other jobs. Many of them are um, essentially artisanal or um, type positions. They're electricians and they're also a member <coughs> of the state legislature. Or they're, a, in fact, one field that's actually virgin, uh, which is a, a vocational um, technical program, is medical technology. People who get trained in medical technology also get trained in communicating, but the pay is very good. Uh, the demand is high because of the rise of medical technology, and the success rate is huge. That's very interesting. The most important kind of diversity, of course, in educational institutions is intellectual diversity, yes. ideological yes. diversity. Uh, that's the one that's hardest to have. That's right. 